Hello DV Asia. What I'm going to cover in this video are some of my little top tips across all the different tools in Production Premium. We're going to very quickly move from Premiere to After Effects. We'll cover a little bit of speed grade um, and we'll also cover something in the Adobe Media Encoder you may not have heard about. Um, so to get started inside of Premiere, you know, we have all kinds of wonderful features dealing with trim controls. Um, we really kind of went back to the basics and made sure that our trimming functions and our basic timeline editing functions are industry leading. Um, and this includes advanced edits, uh, different ways of doing match frames. And one in particular that I always get questions about is the idea of doing a fit to fill edit. A fit to fill edit is where we have a gap in our timeline and we have a clip that's a different length and we want to have this clip automatically fill that gap. So we want Premiere to go through and do a rate stretch on the clip so that that gap is filled, even if it means this clip is going to play back more in slow motion. Um, in other NLEs, uh, typically there's a button someplace on the user interface to turn on and, and do a fit to fill edit. Premiere has the same function, but it's a little bit hidden. So I wanted to kind of showcase this today. So to get started, I've already gone through and I've marked an in and out point on my source media here. And you can see we've got just a small section of the source media. It's about a second in length. On my timeline, I've marked an in and out point on my timeline and I've got my track set up so I'm targeting video one where I've got this uh, gap in my timeline. And I'm also targeting audio three. That's where I want the audio to drop in. Um, this gap is actually about three seconds and 20 frames. So there's a mismatch going on here, um, but I'm all set up to do what's called a four point edit right now. I'm gonna use the keyboard command to do an overwrite edit. I'm just gonna tap the uh, period key on the keyboard. Now, as soon as I do that, this box comes up asking about uh, how do I want the source clip to fit inside this gap? So by default, it's gonna say ignore one of the uh, in points or out points. But in this case, what I'm going to do is choose change clip speed, or as it's listed here, fit to fill. Once I do that, it's going to drop that clip in. And if I zoom in on this clip, you'll notice that the clip is actually playing back at a much slower rate. It's going to play back at 34.7%. Um, so what this means is when I actually hit play on my timeline here, I'll go ahead and just mute my audio. When I hit play on my timeline, we'll see that this is actually going to play back at a much slower rate within my overall timeline. And this is uh, doing exactly what I want it to do. It's doing a fit to fill edit. So again, you're not gonna see the button showing up on the user interface, but as soon as you do a three point or a four point edit, um, where you've marked an in point, an out point on your source media, and you've marked either just an in point or an in and an out point on your timeline, um, Premiere Pro will automatically bring up this option for a fit to fill edit. So it's very easy to do. Okay, moving forward, I'm gonna jump over to Adobe After Effects CS6. And one of the new features in After Effects that's getting a lot of the attention right now is our new 3D camera tracker. Now the 3D camera tracker is great for some scenes, but After Effects has other ways of doing tracking. There's the traditional point tracking, and something we introduced a few versions ago is uh, the inclusion of another tool called Mocha. Uh, Mocha AE is still included and bundled with After Effects CS6, and we've actually improved on the workflow uh, to make it much easier to bring your footage over into Mocha and to get started. So now inside of Mocha, or I'm sorry, inside of After Effects CS6, I wanna take this particular clip in my composition and I wanna do some tracking work uh, this sign, I actually need to do the tracking in Mocha because I know it's going to work a little bit better. To do that, I just simply select the layer in my composition, and there's now a new menu command under animation. I have a new tool called Track in Mocha AE. So this solves one of the biggest challenges of really getting started inside of Mocha, which was I would have to open up Mocha independently, I'd have to go find my source clip and import the source clip over into Mocha. Now we can do that in one easy step. What's happening right now is Mocha has actually launched, it's ready in the background, and it's gonna give me an options panel 
that actually shows exactly how I want this clip to import into Mocha. Mocha has some advanced options in here if we need to change things like pixel aspect ratio or if we're dealing with uh, interlaced footage and we need to uh, separate out the fields, we can do that inside of Mocha when we ingest the clip. So once I do this and click OK, here's the source clip over inside of Mocha and now I can get started. There's a lot of tutorials on using Mocha. If you don't see them on uh, on sites like this, there's a company called Imagineer Systems that actually has a number of tutorials that talk about using the planar tracker and the shape layers inside of Mocha. It's a fantastic tool for doing tracking or separating out objects if you need to do some roto work and create an uh, like an occlusion layer inside of After Effects. Now moving forward, we have another tool called Adobe Speed Grade. And this is a brand new tool inside of CS6. We're really happy to have SpeedGrade as part of the CS6 family. What SpeedGrade is designed to be is a color grading tool. And a lot of people are trying this out for the very first time by starting inside of Premiere Pro, taking their timeline, and choosing Send to SpeedGrade. Now the problem with SpeedGrade is SpeedGrade has a special user interface that was designed by people who do very high-end color grading. This is a tool that comes from a very specialty role in the industry. Um, and the software itself, when it was uh, made by a, an independent company, used to sell for tens of thousands of US dollars. So now it's part of the package, but the very first time people open it up, because the interface is different, they kind of don't know where to get started with the software. So I've already sent this project over to SpeedGrade, and uh, I just wanted to walk you through a couple of basic things to, uh, to get started with this. The first thing is the monitoring. By default, SpeedGrade kind of takes up the whole upper half of the, uh, of the screen, and if you go to try and expand out some of the tools, you end up not seeing the entire, uh, the entire video that you're working on. The tools for going through and resizing your monitor are actually found over here in the corner, and the, the best one to remember is this tool here, which is Zoom to Fit, so I can easily turn that on. Now the other tools, when you're doing color grading, having a waveform monitor and a vector scope open on the screen, SpeedGrade's got some great monitoring tools so we can really see what's going on with color. And there's easy keyboard shortcuts to remember these. Um, the W key on the keyboard will open up the waveform monitor. Uh, the histogram is the H. So, uh, and these are also controls that can be found um, right here underneath the monitor, I can toggle the waveform on and off, I can toggle the histogram on and off, and there's even a tool here for uh, bringing up what's called a vector scope, if you're more comfortable and familiar with using a vector scope. So once I have all these different tools open on the screen here, now I can kind of sort of see what I'm doing. The playhead for the uh, speed grade timeline is a little bit different. You actually grab it from the bottom. And you'll notice here I'm actually grabbing this playhead and I'm kind of moving this around on my, uh, on my timeline and we're starting to see this playback here off my hard drives. Now the next step in getting started with SpeedGrade is the first thing a lot of people start doing in SpeedGrade is they start to click on these clips and go in, into the look and start to move these sliders around. You can do that, but best practices are to actually create a layer on top of your clips. So to do that, I'm going to go to my Timeline tab, and there's a little button down here. And if you look at the icon for this button, it actually has uh, this red, green, and blue indicating color, and it's showing the color of getting broken out into an additional track. So if you've started in your timeline, and maybe like this clip, I've started adding a little bit of a color grade to this, we can actually just move that up into a new layer here by clicking on this button. If you watch the timeline, you'll see that this adds a new layer on top. So this is an easy way if we've started doing some grading on these clips and we want to move it up into a, uh, a new track, we can easily do this by clicking this one button. The next thing is getting started in speed grade. The look tab is where we actually start to do some of our color manipulation. So I'm going to just stretch this up and once again I'll hit the uh, scale to fit so we can see our entire frame. Don't be afraid of any of the controls inside of SpeedGrade. There's a lot of tutorials on how to use these. Um, any of the uh, tools are available, 
They're grayed out to start with, indicating they haven't been adjusted or modified. So as soon as I come in here and I start to play with this control, let's just make this clip look a little bit warmer. We'll kind of push it. Actually, let me select the, uh, the grading layer here. You can see in this case, we've kind of started to add some different grading to this. Um, as I start to move these controls around, we can start to see a bit of an adjustment happening to our video. And uh, I'll go ahead and select the primary grade. Let's just push this clip back over, and make it warmer. These are designed to be very subtle adjusters. So one thing that you'll notice right away is you know, I'm not using my uh, trackpad here and able to go all the way out to the edges very easily. It's designed to help make a nice subtle adjustment to your video so that you don't uh, overpower the video. So now I can start to kind of play around with these controls. You can see that this control is active. It means I've made a change to this. This control is active. And I can go through and I can reset these controls by clicking these little triangles. And it'll reset the clip back to kind of a neutral state and we, I can start over again if I like. So that's sort of a quick basic uh, few steps to get you started inside of SpeedGrade CS6. Um, I don't have time to do a complete tutorial on this and there are some nice tutorials online that kind of talk about this, but at least getting you to a point where you can experiment with this. This is an extremely powerful tool for getting color, the look and feel of the video that you want, using color for emotional purposes, uh, as part of a storytelling technique, speed grade is an awesome tool for being able to do that. Now I'm going to wrap up here with one last little tip and trick here. Um, over in the Adobe Media Encoder, the Media Encoder is included with CS6, and it's the place where we can render out files from applications like Premiere, Prelude, Adobe Encore, even Adobe After Effects projects can be opened up inside of the Media Encoder. So part of the power of the media encoder is the fact that I can actually just drag and drop files into the media encoder if I want them to transcode. So what I'm going to do here is just sort of minimize this down a little bit so I've got a little real estate here on the screen. And I'm going to take this and just drag this and drop it right into the media encoder. And what this is going to allow me to do is pick and choose what formats I want to transcode this file to. So I've got this loaded. By default, it's come up with the last preset that I used, which in this case was DPX files. I don't want to use DPX. I want to actually get this file kind of prepared and ready for my tablet device. So I chose H.264. It's automatically picked one of the presets for tablets. Um, I can go through and choose a different preset if I want. In this case, maybe uh, we'll choose the 960 by 540 iPad or the 1080p preset for the newer iPads. We've now got that listed here. And again, I can go through this list of all the different types of devices, uh, different types of formats that I want to be able to output to. Uh, Vimeo is another social uh, sharing site. I can actually just double click on this and it will add it to the list of presets that that's going to be encoded into. Now, if you haven't seen this before, this is one of the reasons that the media encoder is so much faster in CS6. When I start this encoding, instead of starting from the top of the list, and just encoding one file at a time, what the media encoder does is it will encode multiple files all simultaneously. And this is one of the reasons that the media encoder is so much faster inside of CS6 than past versions. So if you ever have to do a lot of file conversion, or if you ever have to deal with uh, um, you know, Premiere projects, then you just want them to render out faster. The new CS6 media encoder is kind of a secret weapon to get your jobs done faster and it's something that I think uh, you'll enjoy using. So there you have it. There's a series of uh, different tips and tricks from Premiere to After Effects to the new Adobe SpeedGrade and finally the Media Encoder. I hope you find them useful. Thanks for watching.